<laughs> Greetings, everyone, <laughs> and welcome to a beautiful <laughs> edition of Monster Party. Monster Party. Monster Party. Monster Party. Monster Party. It's, it's be fantastic. It's be oh, awesome. Yes. It's be great. Sure. <laughs> All those things that don't really start with a B, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just roll with it. Order. <laughs> But you know what? We're all together again, and this is going to be a great show. It's the and, new uh, year. The we're new year. We're, yeah, starting it off with a yes. bang. And speaking Which of starts bangs, with B. It starts with, with B. B. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But hey, let me introduce myself for the new year. I am Matt Weinhold. I am Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Stroth. And I'm James Gonis. And for this episode, oh man, oh. like I said, mm. it's a bang. It's a... Uh, it's like an explosion of this kind of stuff that we like to talk about. Yes. Uh, with a bunch of talent added on to that. It's yes, just a, for sure. It's a mountain of fun. <laughs> We're all big fans of low budget cinema. Yes. And sometimes yes. you can get a way more entertaining movie with a lower budget than a bigger budget because you have to be more creative. Some of these lessons certainly could be learned by some filmmakers today. So <laughs> what the topic is for this episode is the B movie legacy. The B movie legacy. The B movie <laughs> legacy. Oh, what have the B movies taught us? Sometimes right. what they attempt doesn't work so well, but then sometimes even that can turn into something fun and Right. Dare I say even genius. So Absolutely. we're talking bee, bee movies like The Swarm and The Deadly Bees? Is that No, 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 no. no. Okay. Not, but I, I mean. I see what you did. <laughs> yeah, Very <okay>. nice. <laughs> That's, I had to. Buckle your lap belts, everybody. <laughs> uh, but for this type of episode, <laughs> we need some really great guests. People who yes. who love these films the way that we do. Yes. They know B films. They understand. B yes. Films. They love the B films. Absolutely. And our two guests for this episode, Stephen Peros and Larry Blemeyer, are both writers, filmmakers, authors, actors, movie historians, and above all, fellow monster kids. Stephen wrote the screenplay for The Cat's Meow, based on his own play starring Kirsten Dunst, based on the true story of the 1920s Hollywood murder scandal. That took place on William Randolph Hearst's yacht, which was directed by none other than Peter Bogdanovich. Nice. Stephen also was a writer on the Jackie Chan and Stephen Coogan remake of Around the World in 80 Days. Uh -huh. He wrote and produced the TV movie A Country Christmas with Do Dolly Parton and wrote and directed the ghost thriller The Undying, the quirky Hollywood-based mystery Footprints, among others. Stephen has also done numerous audio commentaries on vintage genre films as well as writing graphic novels, including Stoker and Wells, about the fictional adventures of Bram Stoker and H.G. Wells. Larry Blemeyer is probably best known to our listeners as a director and star of the cult movie parody, The Lost Skeleton of Cadaver, <laughs> which is a wonderful send-up and love letter to vintage low-budget horror and sci-fi films. Fun stuff. Larry yeah. also wrote, starred, and directed the sequel, The Lost Skeleton Returns Again, as well as his other monster horror parodies, Trail of the Screaming Forehead, Dark right. and Stormy Night. Larry is also a playwright, artist, comic book illustrator, and film expert with numerous Blu-ray commentaries under his belt as well. And most recently, together, Stephen and Larry have co-written the movie guidebook, Giant Beast Cinema, featuring reviews of some of their favorite and our favorite horror and sci-fi movies, including titles like Attack of the Crab Monsters, The Giant Claw, The Monster That Challenges the World, The Giant Gila Monster, <laughs> Attack ah, of the Big no Foot well. Woman, and many others. Yeah. So please give a giant Monster Kid welcome to Stephen Peros and Larry yeah. Blair. Stephen and Larry! Yeah. Welcome. 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 welcome! welcome, guys. Welcome to the best <laughs> podcast out there. Ever. Thanks for being Ever. with us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Of course. So I think we should 
start maybe by just we'd like to hear from you guys. You know, obviously, you guys are into all the same stuff that we are. Yes. And you're on the same age as us. What were your Monster Kid origins? What were your early inspirations that got you into horror and sci-fi? Well, let Larry uh, let Larry lead on this one. Uh, well, uh, okay. you know, it was uh, it was late night TV, and the thing that, as much as I love like the uh, Universal uh, classics, the thing on late night TV as as a little kid, you know, sneaking up to watch it or staying up much later than I should, it was the '50s science fiction horror movies better known as monster movies. And that's, you know, and there's a wide range there. I mean, you can look at, if you look at, for instance, Fiend Without a Face, which was a film that grabbed me. Ah, <laughs> and yeah. just never let go. Um, <laughs> and you get Stack of the Crab Monsters. There's a big difference there in the production and the amount of money and stuff. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They all have a certain magic to them. And I can pinpoint one, I can pinpoint a shot that did it for me. At the beginning right. of Attack of the Crab Monsters, uh, the writer of that film, Chuck Griffith, who who wrote such great stuff for Corman, he's playing a sailor near the beginning of the movie, and he falls over out of the the rowboat, and um, and there's an underwater shot of him uh, of a claw giant crab, and Griffith does an underwater scream, <laughs> and that something about that was just absolutely electrifying, and and I still love it, I still love it. So that started it for me, and um, you know I've been hooked ever since. Well, I was, you know, I was raised in New York and we were blessed uh, in the, well, it was the era before VCRs. Uh, we were blessed to have three awesome syndicated channels. We had uh, Channel 9, WR, Channel 11, PIX, uh, yeah. and Channel NEW. But nine, it was 9 and 11, really, that, or, and 9 in particular, that had all of the monster movies. I was the youngest, I'm the youngest of three. The oldest brother is all the other film nut in the family. Uh, he's six years older than me. And he was the Warner Brothers gangster and MGM musical guy. So I think I had to I had to rebel and, and have my own thing, <laughs> which Universal Monsters. And so it just, you know, we mentioned it, a few of us mentioned it in the book at different times. But this whole idea that movies then when you grew up in that era, uh, they were like Haley's Comet. You either caught them or you like you had that dreaded experience we've all had <laughs> of how you wake up to the, the tail credit music. Oh! <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. I gotta wait months to see this movie, and you just, you just, why the cruelty of waking you up just to see the end on the screen? Uh, but that was, you know, that was it. it. Was watching these movies, falling in love with these movies. Um, then when VCRs came in, I was in junior high, recording them. You know, do you do it at the six hour speed and 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 have three on them on, on a tape? But they look crappy. But it's okay because this, I just want more. I need to have these movies in yeah. my hands as much as possible. And then you know, a VHS tape. If you wanted to own a movie was eighty nine ninety nine wow. then, mm -hmm. you know, which is a million dollars today. I think. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's I just fell in love with it in New York, and and it, and and I remember someone asking my, my my parents used to feed it. Fortunately, my mother had met someone very wise who said, "Oh, if you when you raise your kids." Just see what they gravitate towards and feed that, you know, sh shy of it being that I like to tear apart frogs or something. Uh, <laughs> if it seems like you're no different than what I like to do, if I like train, but I like to draw. So I would get lots of sketch pads. And I love monster movies. I'd get Christmas and, and, and my birthday was the monster books, Super 8 films. We had a little Super 8 projector. So, you know, the, and at one point someone said, when do you think he'll grow out of it? And, uh, and I just laughed, you know, I'm going to grow out of it. Grow out of what? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, it kind of defines us, really. Yes, exactly. So. And, and we're all collectors, too. And your story is exactly the same as mine when it comes to, especially <laughs> like the Super 8 films. I had the projector and everything I could get my hands on with that. And then, you know, collecting toys and books. And, and I remember I was on a date and we went back to my place. And the person who I was with looked at my collection and said, when are you going to get rid of all this stuff? <laughs> and, and I was just like, wow, you really don't understand me at all. Uh, this is this is only going to get bigger. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you about this. There's a funny story about. So, oh, you're, um, so, uh, so your picture behind you for our listeners yeah, who can't see, yeah. you, you have a beautiful poster of War of the Gargantuas, well, but it's it's not the American version. It's it's what version yeah. is it? French version, Le Guerre, Le Guerre de Monstre. Oh, um, it's beautiful, beautiful. So, but it, it's funny because you talk about dating. 
my ex and I split up. We've been together a long time between dating and marriage. We were together, I don't know, fit, I, I'm, I'm losing track, uh, 14 years, 15 years. So, you know, single guy again. I said, you know, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep the posters minimal out here because, you know, <laughs> to bring somebody home and they're going to be like, okay. Uh, yeah, right. and, you know, <laughs> so I had something generic up over here and I had maybe one, one non monster poster over there. And, I started dating someone and she was looking at this thing across the way, which was just this generic thing. And she's like, why, what, what do you like about that? I'm like, Oh, I get it. So you're saying you don't like it. Says, yeah. I said, well, I have something big for that space, but you would never want me to hang it. Oh, I'd love to see it. So she sat across from me. I said, all right, close your eyes. And I took this and I stood on this chair and I, and I held this thing out and she's like, Oh my God, you gotta hang that. And that's what ah. she, that she was a girl. And then, and then she said, why is all your collection in boxes? You got, and I have some stuff hanging, but a collective one. I think another monster one next to it. And I said, I said, so here's the three. I said, which one? I said, you know, I have a tarantula, Mothra, and Colossus of New York. And she said, hang all three. <laughs> so that's when I knew she was the girl for me. And it's. I was going to say, who, who is this woman? <laughs> yeah, Miss Light is who she is. <laughs> well, yeah, that's awesome. She hasn't asked me to put it away yet. <laughs> and, and Stephen, you're right, too, about the whole thing about growing up as a kid watching late night television. It was like a challenge to get, to, you know, you, this stuff was usually really late at night. So I think we all kind of pretty much had the same kind of parents who were very – just encouraged us to embrace this stuff. So I was usually just me by myself in a big chair in the living room where everybody else is asleep. We're trying to stay up and watch these. And, and I grew up on, in Pennsylvania, so I also had WORTV mm-hmm. and Channel and Chiller Theater with Chili Billy. But yeah, we've said many times how this stuff was just on television. If you missed it, you had to wait another year maybe for it to come around. And to actually view this stuff and see this these movies – all by yourself, it's just you, you know, and it's just, it's, I mean, there's, it's nothing, special. there's nothing more heartwarming than seeing a seven year old kid with a pot of coffee watching, <laughs> watching late night horror films. Larry, Larry, did you, what? did you go through the TV guide and circle yeah. or cut out things in the TV guide? I, did, to say, I, didn't, uh, I noted them. I definitely noted them in the TV guide. Um, I just wanted to mention something about, you know, now we take access for granted and I have a, I have a, a monster kid son who is now thirteen. He started. I think I started about age six. I started showing him monster movies. He loves nice black and white monster movies, but he has no idea of how how he, he cannot appreciate the I access know. that he has. For instance, the Magic Sword. He's seen that more times than I have because it's on a Blu-ray here, and he can watch it whenever yeah. he wants. And the same with Gila Monster and other favorites of his. He doesn't understand what it was like for us to wait and wait and hope that this movie would show up again somehow, somewhere. Yeah, I know. It was like I said, it, it made it special. It was like it was kind of like we were in our own little secret club, you mm-hmm. know. And, and and the horror hosts too were like our avenue into that too. That's why we right. identified with the horror hosts. They're like, yeah, this is for us. This is for, yeah, this is my own little thing, you know. In some ways, today it's great because we do have the access to everything, but. I don't know, maybe somehow we paid more attention to this stuff back then, you know? That's why it's stuck in our brains so well, I think, because it was this exotic thing that nobody else really knew about or was interested in, in a way, you know? No, it was more of an event when when these things were on, and if we were lucky enough to catch them. And I remember going to school on a Monday and, uh, you know, talking with friends, like, in the cafeteria. Oh, did you see this on Saturday night, you know? Yeah. Those days are gone. Well, yeah, Yeah. but it's... I was t- talking with s- someone about, you know, how uh, e- everything is available and shows come on. But yet the things that get the most eyeballs that most people talk about are sporting events. Those you can't those happen. And everyone right. has to be there. if you want to watch the Super Bowl, you have to stop what you're doing and yeah. watch the Super Bowl. There, and then there are certain shows. Even now they're saying, no, we're not dumping our whole season all at once. We're actually mm-hmm. going to put out two episodes and you have to wait two weeks, two more and people are, so there is a part of the human experience, certainly the child experience that like that, that gets bored with just having a pile of candy in front of you. You know, you, you, you want to earn, you know, you want the adventure, you know, there's no adventure in becoming a monster kid. Now it's just, it's all just there. If you got to, if you're lucky enough, uh, lucky enough to have Tubi or something, you know, well, it's free. So you don't have to pay for that. 
you know, I guess there's a little bit of adventure because probably none of your friends are on it. And that's the famous monsters of film land for today's generation. It's like, did right. you see Monster Adrian Blancas? This is really weird movie I discovered, you know? So yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to be born any time other than when I was born, <laughs> you know? I don't, I, <laughs> yeah. Envy uh, this generation and, and how they have entertainment and how they have media, let alone that they're living in a nine, post 9 11 world and all that crap. But, uh, oh, yeah, I, yeah. The, you know, you meet so many kids, even now kids who and, who admire the 80s. They're all about, and I realize the more I look at it and the shows that they want to watch or the retro shows or the movies that they like, it's because this this era they didn't get to have, which is mom lets you leave on your bike and then as long as you're back for dinner, you know, you could go right. on it. If you weren't so, uh, protected you were so much fear as they obviously were grown up so they admire this uh and covet this thing that they never were able to have it's, it's sort of the end of it i think was the 80s the 90s it all started kicking in you know uh what what's neat steven is like larry i have a kid too she, now she's 18 but she's also a monster kid as well i yeah, you've raised really, her well Larry. And, and the funny <laughs> thing is when i've talked to her friends her friends are saying Wow, Kathy is like a film expert, and I'm like, wow, what's that? It's because I have, oh, you know, throughout her entire life, it's not. I, I wasn't like, you must watch this. It was like, would you like to watch? And she was like, so into it, and and she got really into these movies and stuff. And to to hear that her friends are calling her a film expert, what makes me feel happy is these B films that a lot of these that we've talked about would will talk about whether they're 40s, 50s, 60s. You know, I've exposed my daughter to these. Larry's exposing his kid. And these kids of ours are going to, like, share them with others. So yeah. hopefully, you know, right. these films will not be forgotten. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I have a friend whose son is just really into, he was into werewolves. He'll go on YouTube and just watch these compilations of werewolf transformations. He doesn't have a great attention span watch watching whole movies. He loves watching just the sequences. And he got really hooked on, not that long ago, on uh, the beast within from the eighties and the oh. then and at one point for those of you who know the beast within it's about a you know the the reason this this kid turns into this teenage monster is because his mom in the opening is like I don't know raped by a beast or an alien or a creature so now this, this son's asking me he's not been allowed to watch the whole movie he says so why is he a beast and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, you know, something happened and, and the mom had to get, well, what happened exactly? <laughs> I said, you know, you're going to have to talk to your dad about what happened at the beginning. Of this <laughs> yeah, this is a very strange way to get into the birds and the bees talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> uh, the fact that this is an episode about bee movies, one of the things that I think is so great about what you guys have done with your kids is that you have prepped them to be able to appreciate something that had a meager budget, obviously. And then, of course, black and white is always that stumbling block. Sometimes you have to get over. But the fact that someone from this day and age, a kid from you know this generation can look at one of these films and still appreciate it, that's, that's amazing. Because even as a kid, watching these things on TV, I realized the difference between a big A production and... And one of these movies. And I realized, okay, they had less money to work with. And yeah, that monster looks a little cheaper than, you know, the big movie. But I always admired these films because they showed, hey, maybe you could make this. Yes. And, uh, yes. and what they lacked in money, they made up for in some creative storytelling. I know that in your book, you guys talk about the giant claw. Yeah, Which I think is actually a really good movie. And especially if Ray Harryhausen had done the special effects for the giant claw, that movie right. would be looked at entirely different because all the yeah. all the dramatic performances and the storytelling and the ideas are mm -hmm. fabulous. And yeah, even, it, yeah. even with the puppet, even with the puppet, <laughs> I'm telling you, that thing captivated me. I drew pictures of it all the time as a kid growing up. <laughs> I love the giant claw. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a quintessential giant monsters movie from the 50s that, that, that like I said, just happens to have a really goofy looking puppet monster in it. But it has all the tropes, all the trappings of like the stuff that we loved, you know? 
No, it's true. I got. I was. I. I was lucky enough that the editor, me, let me write that chapter because <laughs> I just had to. I just love the film and revisiting it. I got to say, the reason that film gets so many people writing about it is the exact reason why it's an amazing film. Is because once once you see the giant claw, you never forget it. Once you see this puppet that everybody makes fun of, you never forget it. When you really watch it again. You realize the close-ups, the, the, the face is actually articulated. It's got flaring yes. muscles and yeah. the eyes look down. And, there's, uh, and it just chomps on these guys going down in their parachutes. There's, there's something about the giant claw that I don't know if I would have wanted to see the Harryhausen version, which would, which would have been, they would have, you know, uh, right. it was well, the same team moving on from Earth versus the Flying Saucers. And whether the Harryhausen said no or whether he was busy, I don't know. What the, 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 the there's no real record of why he didn't go, but he was approached. And yeah, I just think it's it's an awesome film. I just think it's yeah, it's so entertaining. It's so many layers of insanity. It's not only this giant bird, but it's also invisible, and it all it also has a protective field around. Yeah, it's it. like, like antimatter, antimatter or something. Like yeah, what is it? Yeah, when that scientist explains the origin <laughs> of that scene, this is one of the most amazing scenes. <laughs> yes. like, it's like what? And you buy it. You buy yeah, it. You, you, totally you buy, buy it. 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 Yeah, it makes you, logical sense. Yeah, well, even though it, it looks like an earthbound giant mutant vulture, but it's still. But no, yeah. it's from outer space and it's made of antimatter, of course. Then, then, then in this movie that's only like 62 minutes, there's like a seven minute scene on a plane, a little sexy little scene be, between Jeff Morrow and, and uh, I'm blanking on the female lead. And they're just like talking about how they're going to solve stuff. But in the meantime, they're kind of flirting. And it's actually one of those scenes that plays and, you know, they got to eat up seven minutes of screen. <laughs> right, right. Mara, Mara, Mara Corday. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. It was a real oh. too. You know, yeah. if it was stop motion, maybe it would have ended up looking like Q. You know that film? Yeah. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, of course. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Love Q. Yeah. 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 Well, and then, awesome. Larry, you brought up Unknown Island in the book. You yeah. reviewed that movie. And that's another one where I felt like the thing that everyone made fun of, the guys in the dinosaur suits. T-Rex suits. Yeah. Yeah. When I watched it, I thought it gave it a look that was different and unusual I just bought it. I once again the dramatic performances. Everybody is great. Richard Denning, my God, this tortured man who has to <laughs> live through all this. It's terrific, and I and, and I hope that we still have people in the future who can go back to these movies and see these films through the eyes of the past. Yeah, and and uh, you got to mention Barton McLean. Shut up, I'm Barton McLean. Oh. <laughs> yeah. no, um, I'll kill you. I'm Barton McLean. He, he's oh. just. You know, uh, he he really is. W whatever he's doing, he's going full blast in it. Right. Um, and it's you mentioned. You know, you accept, and it's all about accepting this stuff. It's as soon yes. as you buy into it, it you, it's a certain license that you take. Griffin, you know, my, my son does the same thing with these films. He accepts it, and I swear they're all. And of course, they're all practical effects, and the practical wins every time. Yes, he thinks the yes. dragon in the magic sword is the best dragon that he's ever seen. And he's oh. seen motion and, it, and he's seen uh, CGI dragons. But the one in the magic sword, that's, you can touch. You can yeah, touch I know. It's, we, um, yes, we've talked many times. You talked about the CGI versus practical. It's true. It's like, there's no, no matter how good CGI gets. And it's, it's amazing. And there's some great CGI creatures and creations out there, but nothing beats practical. As a kid, as a kid, when I watched these and using Unknown Island, people may laugh at the dinosaurs, but to me, I'm thinking someone made that. Yeah, right. Someone had to physically craft that and make that. I I would love a Tyrannosaurus Rex costume like that. <laughs> and and I want to be but, inside but, it. I want to be inside too. And you know, it's funny. Uh, that I weird. had two. I had two older <laughs> brothers who were always kind of, you know, as a kid, they were kind of mean to me. Ah, that's stupid. Why do you watch that stupid? You know, it's like. And so when I when I was watch these films by myself, or maybe with my younger brother or sister, you know, it was like almost as if these films were made for me. Yeah, you know, right? And right. as as Larry had mentioned. When that film started, and you see when you see the dinosaur stuff, and it's like you accept it. You accept this is that universe. This is right. that world. This <laughs> is what they look like. Buy into it, and and then you follow along and you believe everybody as as when they're we're acting and uh, uh, going through the story. 
And maybe it's, you know, maybe one reason why someone like my older brothers who are go, Larry, I can't believe you. like It's such a stupid movie. Maybe it's something about when we saw these as kids, there was something about them that spoke to us, whether we could in our mind, we were able to accept them and that's yeah. what made us enjoy them more. And now, I mean, I can still watch that today and enjoy yeah. it just oh, yeah. as much. Yeah. It's maybe like, it's, right. maybe yeah. it's reminiscent. Of, it reminds me of growing up. I don't know. I think, like you said, Larry, at a young age, we're kind of conditioned at that young age because we're seeing – if you're young enough and you're watching something like that, like, what is this thing? Like, you're just – you know, the whole idea of a movie or watching something on TV when you're – if it's young enough, you're like – it's a kind of this magical box, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but speaking of the T-Rex outfits and wearing one of those, isn't there the legend that, like, you see one of the T-Rexes fall over because the guy passed out from exhaustion or heat exhaustion <laughs> or something when he kind of falls down, he's shot? Yeah, I, the, the best account of that is, um, and I can't remember exactly. Bob the Burns. Bob but in this case, the Bob Burns, yeah. Oh, his, yeah. His, when we, Griffin and I had a, a great chat with him uh, just over the holidays. And oh, was nice. Really gonna talk, and, and that was just, that was so cool for me to have Griffin talking to Bob. And um, uh, Bob, is he still has so many details in his mm. head about these experiences of being, you know, watching these guys sweat their butts off in the desert in these suits, you know. But, you know, I, I like to think that we all have, we, all of us here on this call have what is like a B-movie acceptance filter. Yes. It's automatically in place. It, we don't have to set it. We don't have to do anything. It's there. It's automatic. And, um, and I don't know if it's because we grew up with these movies or is it just you know that's just us? <laughs> I don't. I mean, yeah, I don't. there's like a monster kid strain maybe in all of yeah. us that other people don't have or something. I think know? there's a gene. I think there's maybe I think there's yeah. a. I think the reason why we could buy into it at that age was that we had this ingrained sense of wonder, and so yeah. you want to make that leap. You don't want to fight it. You want to accept it because you want right. to be in that <laughs> world. And these movies looked absolutely different from what most of everybody else was watching. And so I'd come upon unknown Island and this whole world looks different and, right. and new and exciting and something that I can't see in the real world. And that just sparked my imagination. And uh, so, I mean, I'd be willing to make that leap for even <laughs> way lesser movies, let's just say. But you know, it's, <laughs> You know, I remember back in the certainly in the nineties, people were like, you know, audiences are much more kids are much more sophisticated, much more sophisticated. And you keep like judging and kids, they will always challenge that by what they want. Then they all wound up accepting this totally unrealistic show called Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, with all of its kaiju guys in suits running around and fighting. And no one would ever have expected that to have connected the way it did. I mean, then you go you go outside the genre like titanic where people were like oh my god i can't believe we put we put our two studios put money into this thing thing things gonna sink fast in the titanic no audience gonna see it nobody will want to see this movie kids don't see period films kids don't even know what the titanic is. and they actually are who made it a hit was kids but i wanted to say, point to two things you guys just mentioned number one unknown island larry's chapter on, on unknown island and and all of his five chapters are just absolutely impeccable a fusion of not only someone who's a historian who got the history and what the films did the digging and in some cases like with Bob Burns new people connected but they the chapters are funny I I, I mean it was so much fun to to read Larry's chapters and put them out there and, and that and that made me revisit the film and like it me a too. lot more did when I maybe saw it I don't know 25 years earlier it's such an entertaining so much more entertaining than I recall <laughs> called it being but and then to the cgi point that you made the in, really fascinating thing is you can watch the most recent jurassic park and then you can watch spielberg's jurassic park from what well, how, how many years old is it now is it almost it's from 93 it's from 93, 93. 30, 30 year old movie and you watch that it is he just like peter jackson did with the lord of the rings films he understood this thing called cgi is best when you merge it and you fuse it with tactile the audience may not know it but they will know it they'll feel it you can have a cgi dinosaur in the rain and then he walks out of frame and then this big practical head enters frame he understood that that's how it had to be used you watch it now it's more convincing more transporting than the most recent jurassic park film which just wall to wall cgi totally 
and I say it all the time, like people yeah. don't realize how much of Stan Winston is in the original Jurassic Park than than mm-hmm. and Phil a lot more than you think. Yeah. Yep. And you're right. Now the CGI is so much more elaborate in the newer films, but you just don't care. It's just it washes mm-hmm. over you. And yeah. you're yeah. right. I mean it's it's kind of it's kind of amazing actually that the original Jurassic Park does hold up. You're right. It holds up yeah. very well. Yeah. Doesn't seem dated in its technology and nothing about it. And and it's it's it, I, I saw they re-released it in 3D and I heard they just did that with Jaws. And and you watch it and you think it was a 3D movie. And you don't realize how much Spielberg composes for depth and what's in the foreground, what comes in the uh, background foreground. And I was watching this in 3D uh, here. And I was like, oh my God, you would think he had made it in 3D. I mean, when the velociraptors leap up from below while the girl is dangling, you it's, it looks like it was constructed yeah, for, right. for 3D. <laughs> what it wasn't but uh, you know, it's in a way it's almost the same way that like the original jaws works because you actually don't see the shark that much and that's really because it didn't, wasn't working all the time if it was it would have been a different movie i think in the same way you could draw the comparison to jurassic park where like i said it's the balance of stan winston practical stuff and cgi if he just went with the cgi it wouldn't have been the same it, it's, mm-hmm. it's yeah I, I absolutely agree you know, it's funny you talk. We talk about our memories of these films and and the ingenuity they had, and what what kids remember. You know, kids just like audiences today. We remember the ends of movies. We'll forgive the beginnings if the if it rallies at the end. And I went and revisited the Criterion DVD of Fiend Without a Face. Shockingly, mm. and I hadn't watched it in years. And and just like me, you guys, just like my memories, this crawling brain and the stop motion, and in particular, you you couldn't believe you were allowed to watch. It because it seems so gory when they shoot it. The the blood gurgles out like tomato tomato juice or something, <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm seeing a really gory movie. This is amazing. You watch it now as an adult. It's literally the last seven minutes of the movie. Right. I mean, they're invisible for like forty eight minutes, and then right at the end, I had and I couldn't believe. Like I fell in love with this movie with so much, so much without monsters for almost its entire definitely. 85 percent of its length there's not a yeah. monster that's invisible you know it's crawling around. you know what you know what helps that though throughout the beginning of that movie is the sound the sound of those things crawling yes i got a little i got a little uh, oh there he is little, oh, uh, hey. from model hey. kit yeah from model kit i'm <laughs> showing up a little figure uh, of the feet but yeah no i i agree i also that stop motion i think it was like a german effects yeah, company or something that worked amazing crude, effects for back but, then. but but, it, but, but, but i think effective. that even helps it because uh, it, well, yeah, I, uh, look when it when it uh, goes through the puddle of water on the porch, yeah. and then it peels the screen. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's elegant, man. Yeah. That is yeah. elegant. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or when the tentacles picks up a hammer, <laughs> and stretches, yeah. like and remember, it's just it's incredible. Like that that yeah that movie and cr- the crawling eye to me are always yeah. I thought a great, oh, a great yeah. double feature, oh, yeah. great fifties monster double feature. You know, um, but yeah, you're right. And again, it it just it just it impacts you. You know, it's like, I mean, yeah, did it. It could do a CGI fiend without a face running around. Not the same, you know. Well, and, and you know, it's different with it. It's pixels, okay? These little pixels that you you can shift and manipulate. It's so different when you have to construct and manufacture and create an actual brain with antennas. <laughs> and I mean, the, come on, who doesn't love the film uh, The Thing? Okay, uh, John right. Carpenter's The Thing right, with practical course. effects all over the place. I mean. We, we always talk about how great it is. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and so whether it's like the dinosaur costume or the, the brain or, or whatever it is, just th- th- I love the craftsmanship that goes into this. And even – look, even when you see a monster that may not look the greatest, like let's say uh, It or – Terror um, from Beyond Space. Yeah, right. Terror from Beyond Space. Hey, still, them's, fight, them's fighting words. <laughs> even, even i'm just saying i'm just saying you know I, I i have i feel like my brothers are over my shoulder going oh you like that i'm just saying that even if people poke fun of it or think that it's not that great still you know someone constructed that you know somebody yeah. made that well and and and, and paul blaisdell paul, in, yes uh, he, he was put through he 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 was really given a a, a rough time on on it the terror yes. An unsung it, creative uh, force. Yeah, yeah, and and he was discouraged again and again by by working with uh, the studios, and it was not a pleasant situation on the set. And uh, uh, you know, and the costume was hindered by him not having the. You know, it ended up being not him playing the part, but a much bigger guy, Crash Corrigan. And by the way, I, I just I've got to mention In the Terror is a great example of Griffin has seen it. 
a thousand times. And he's on the commentary track on the the recent the last year's Blu-ray. Oh, nice. I did an interview with him and because I do these commentaries with Tom Weaver. And he he you know calls me in to do a, my my two cents and I, I interviewed Griffin and Tom loved it so he's on there and um That's and we awesome. asked, you know he talks about the black and white does the black and white bother you and then he said no not at all he said and I loved his answer about that because he said it doesn't because something to the effect that if it were color I might be able to see what's in the shadows or something like that <laughs> and it just to me it was like. Yeah, yeah, you know, he's he 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 says he loves color movies, but that black and white has its place, you know, which absolutely I think is cool, you know. But and get the terror, Edward L. Kahn, I, I think, did a, f- a really phenomenal job of directing that film, and it it, it is the shadowiest sci fi film from the, yeah. from the 50s, easily, and the mood is just phenomenal. And Steve's you're a, you're a fan too, right, man? Oh, I, I think there's no movie that wouldn't be improved if Edward L. Kahn directed it instead of whoever else directed it. I mean, he's just, I, mean, I just, I mean, what what he always had was, he just always had a, a velocity in his storytelling. His movies always moved. I mean, sometimes yeah. you watch a 65-minute movie and you're surprised at how slow it is, you know, right. sometimes. Mm-hmm. A little creaky, but from 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 a B movie. I mean, I I I, know, I I haven't seen it in a while. But Attack the Fifty Foot Woman, I remember being s- slow. I'm like, how can a sixty five minute movie be slow? But Edward L. Kahn, between that and um, Invisible Invaders and Creature with the Ad Brain, I mean, yeah. these movies were all. I mean, he basically invented the zombie that we now see today. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in, in Invisible Invaders, all these people. It's an, it's an alien presence which actually arguably that's what the night of the living dead series is about they're all it's all these suited people walking around awakened from the dead who, who are now going to kill them wandering around bronson caves and uh, out there in the fields and so this is exactly what was later done in the, the last man on earth and then which is what romero points to and has said in interviews was this inspiration to do the vincent price last man on earth inspired him to do night of the living dead so He's just, uh, you know, he's 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 just, he's just a whole lot of fun in his movies. That's what I loved about. I'd always know if he directed it, I will not be bored because he's yeah, a, and those movies move and they're just yeah. they're always entertaining. Yeah. You're right. I, lo- yeah. I love the, all those films. They're great. And Blaisdell, by the way, yet another group of characters that are sometimes made fun of. For example, Beulah from It Conquered the World, right. uh, which people call the, what is it, the, you know, the carrot monster or whatever. Yeah. And uh, I think that is a very original looking alien creature. Absolutely. The idea that someone came up with that and through not that much money was able to put this thing together. I think it's wonderful. And once again, I buy into it. Yes. When it's rolled out of the cave, you get a little bit of a better shot of it, but I'm with it. I'm into it. I, totally. and I, and I give him so much credit for what he could do with so little. And, you know, the she creature is, I think one of the oh greatest God. suits of all time. And the, the, saucer, the saucer man. Saucer Man, yeah, right. That's yeah. the, that's the, the, the image of the, yes. the the Martian invader kind of thing from the fifties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you watch this movie for his stuff. That, like, the, you know, especially as a kid, like Blaisdell's creations are what made you watch those movies and what the, the things that stick out for them. Yeah, you know, like the conceive of those kind of very non-humanoid looking monsters, especially back then in the fifties, was just, just incredible. I mean, you know, Cor- Corman, whoever it was, he was working with. Yeah, just go ahead and make this yeah. for a hundred dollars, you know. And Blaisdell and his wife would like in their garage yeah. make these things. I mean, and now you have crews of hundreds of people of special effects technicians yeah. making stuff, but we st- but these monsters still you know live with us and we love them, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then I mean, he wasn't it, just satisfied to have just Beulah, but there's also a bat creature that comes yeah, out of the, Beulah the control unit, that then right? Bites you and then makes you one of its slaves. Great, mm-hmm. you know, the whole idea of the B movie. You know, which which even probably some of your viewers don't realize it. It doesn't. It, it just means you were the second film on the bill of the the A picture had the big stars, the big budget, the studios uh, hovering over it, and the B movie. The the filmmakers are sort of as long as they they did it on the budget that was agreed to, they were pretty much left alone. Um, and when you're left alone, but under a time constraint, is this sort of perfect petri dish to raid that part of your creativity that might not otherwise have been. Rated, you know, I, I talked, you know, Peter, uh, when I worked with Peter Bogdanovich, he 
He had, uh, had been through his phase where he was given everything he wanted, as many days, as much money. And then, then his last, th- his first three, obviously gigantic hits, his next three not, in terms of pilot. And then he was doing stuff on television. And before that, he worked for Corman. He, he, he learned his, his trade uh, with Roger Corman, his, his um, being on a set with Roger Corman. And he, he learned his trade from the great filmmakers who he, he met and knew. And so Peter's like, I've been, he said, I've, I've had everything in the world in front of me and as much time as I wanted. And I've had the other. And you're much more creative when you have less. You're much more creative when you're when you have to make choices. And it isn't whatever you want, sir. Here, whatever you want is not the best a place to make a, uh, an informed creative decision. Knowing that you only have a certain amount of days, a certain amount of, of money. And that's why so many of the great film noirs are the bean noirs like Detour. And the same thing here, these people, as long as you know, Sam Katzman, I think, at, at Columbia's B unit with the werewolf and and, and and the giant claw, as long as these filmmakers, you know, he was just a bottom line guy. It's like, I'm not an artist, I'm a businessman. As long as you met that budget and didn't go over it, you could go off and make the movie however you wanted, and which was, which you you couldn't, the A pictures. The A pictures, they were much mm. more in control. Yeah. So there is something to why are these ones, some of these movies so special is because they inadvertently were given license to make to, to raid their imaginations and make something special. You know, that's a, that's my true belief about why why this happened. There is something about watching uh, a studio picture, like an A picture, where it has the sense of assuredness. You know that it's on a on a studio lot, or maybe there's a budget. But there is something about an independent or a low budget film that has much more of a kind of a spontaneity to it. Yes. That, for me, it draws me in because it's like suddenly anything could happen, theoretically. You know, it becomes more interactive like that. You're sort of hanging on it with a kind of energy that just you don't get a, that experience with a lot of studio movies, especially mm-hmm. the old ones. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like the difference between the original Star Wars and Phantom Menace. When, <laughs> when, right. Luke, when Luke was just struggling to make this little movie that nobody thought would do anything. And then, then he has, like you said, Stephen, he had everything he could possibly want yes men all around him to make phantom menace and look at the difference you know it's just it's absolutely Mm -hmm. well i would also bring up godzilla minus one as a breath of fresh air because you know with all these bloated godzilla films coming from legendary i just to see this film with a relatively minuscule budget and to put all that money in the right place it looks gorgeous Again, a period piece that, you know, as you were saying before, you know, that, oh, that, you know, that's a risk. Kids don't like the period pieces. This thing's a hit. And that CGI, (laughs) they pick and choose those moments. And and it's some of the best CGI I've seen in a, certainly in a monster film. The destruction scenes are, I think, really clean and very well done. And it just goes to show you that. You don't need all this money. Just tell a good story. And as you said, raid your imagination. Yeah. A lot of the CGI is direct now is directed by either people who were raised watching video games and the high tech uh, HD video games, or they think they need to cater to that audience. And when you and I was trying to figure out why is Godzilla minus one's effects seem so uh, so powerful. And it's because they're conceived and boarded for the drama of the storytelling in the moment, right. not trying to dazzle you with the scale of, 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 yes. of it. And also, I love that they designed the monster. So it, it almost looks like a CGI of a guy in a suit. Yes. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it works for the fans uh, a lot in that respect. But yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's, it's $16 million versus $116 million, I think, is is something to take note of and also just what a great reaction it's getting from audiences and how it's this uh it's it's coming back to the chinese it's chinese for like four days like a month ago and then suddenly everyone wanted to see it It was everywhere it's returning this week to the imax screen at brahman's chinese so that's awesome and you know speaking and speaking of black and white i don't know if you heard but the director plans to i think later this year release it in black and white but also not just like slap a black and white filter on it but actually work with the texture and, the, and everything mm-hmm. to make so it'll, it like it would be like a look like a documentary almost canyon piece to the original yeah. yeah well i wanted to ask you how would you compare making a low budget genre film back in the past to now i mean is there even such thing anymore as a b movie really 
Uh, Larry, you want to take this? I, oh, I got all right. Uh, yeah, you know, because I kind of, <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I made Lost Skeleton and Cadaver, which was out of desperation because I had, we had moved out to the West Coast with a company that immediately went under. And right. um, so, whoa, whoa, what do we do? Uh, and, it, you know, the script came to me quickly. And um, it just seemed like, I guess I needed this sudden creative outlet and, uh, you, you know, put it together with uh, with the help of some friends. And, and um, I wrote it in five days, I think, shot it in 10 and a half days. Wow. So we were kind of, I feel like the scrambling that we were doing to move around Lake Arrowhead and and um, and Bronson Bronson Caves and it kind of was um, reliving that uh, some of that feeling of the fifties of you know running by the seat of your pants <laughs> yes. and the sun's going down and we better get this shot because you know we're we're that's we're a little tiny company and and uh, but boy it was you know uh, it was it was a great group of people. A lot of my friends and um then and, and ones who became my friends. So there were there was a feeling that yeah, I really wanted to respect these films that I love at the same time spoofing them in a way that was that was not a slap in the face or or right. looking down your nose at them. I yeah. wanted it to to uh, have a good natured quality to it. Have my cake and eat it too, I guess. Mm -hmm. so, For sure. You know, so I, I feel like <laughs> I have this this memory of like I I made a movie back then in in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and, totally. and Larry just really quickly for listeners who are not familiar with the film could you explain yeah. what that film is <laughs> it, I'm sorry yeah the Lost Skeleton Cadaver is um it's a film uh that I realized after I'd written it that I combined science fiction and horror elements because because the Lost Skeleton is a, is a skeleton like a horror figure but then you got these aliens from the planet Marva Crowbar and Lattice. And they are um, they're very much inspired, very much inspired by Eros and Tana from Plant Nine. Very Plan much, Nine, right? Yeah. So, so it was a mixture of elements, and there's a meteor that has atmospherium, and I played Dr. Paul Armstrong, an intrepid scientist who wants that meteor, and the aliens need the meteor to power their spaceship and get back to the planet Marva. Their mutant gets loose. Everyone has a pet mutant. Theirs gets loose, and so you know it all collides. And, uh, and 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 it's a very silly. I mean, it was really it, for me. It was a, uh, a canvas for absurdity, which is I, I just love absurdity and in all a lot of my stuff. Not everything, but so that's it. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a wonderful. I got to see it in the, in the theater in Los Angeles, and it was like being a kid again in 1980 and going to see Airplane, where you you missed every other line because there's just so much laughter. It's such a funny yeah. movie. Like it is that for any anybody here we, we, you should see, you definitely uh if you haven't seen it you, you should see it but in answer to your to your question is uh, as there be movies will there be b movies again i just think it's redefined you, we don't longer by the true literal sense the, of a film be, uh, being made as the bottom half of a double bill by a by a studio that's not going to happen but are we seeing the equivalent of of a bunch of people getting together with a limited amount of money to do a, a, a horror or a sci-fi film, oh my God, all I have to do is turn on Tubi or Hulu or whatever. The biggest problem now is just how many of them there are and relatively how much cheaper it is to make now than it was then because you're not dealing with film. I mean, 40 years, 40 years ago? No, 30, 84, 94, 04, 14, 20, 40, almost 40 years ago, 39 years ago, I enter NYU and everyone's talking about, oh my gosh, there's this grad student who made a movie, a whole feature film for $165,000. Can you believe it? They were talking about Spike Lee with She's Gotta Have It. Mm. And now, I mean, and that's 40 years ago. Today, people, a lot, you put on Tubi and find some creature feature thing that you never heard of. It, it's made for less than $165,000 in today's dollars. So with the, the advent of, of digital and HD and people editing, not on a Steam bag, they have to go rent somewhere with film, <laughs> but in their living room on their MacBook, you know, you can make there is I just think that the biggest problem now is, yes, there are B, the quote unquote B movies. And there's just too many, just too many, too damn many of them. <laughs> I would also say, too, that there are too many that fool you because I think it is easier now to make a movie that looks slick. I tune into these films and I start watching them and then you realize there's just nothing there. And mm -hmm. I think back in this time that we're talking about the era of the B movies, it was harder to get away with that kind of stuff. You really had to use all your skills and resources to get this thing to look good, to be fresh and inventive. 
And uh, yeah, that's always my problem is I you say, oh, that sounds like an interesting premise. And then you watch two minutes of it and you're like, oh, my God. So, a lot of the people like the, the company, the Asylum, that would do all these monster movies for the yeah. sci-fi panel and the ripoffs. You know, a lot of time and the, the CGI, they're giving them such little money and such little times. It, it, it's a, it looks like crap. And, and it's often not done because, all right, with this money, we're going to do what we can. They're so pissed off at the people who hired them. They're giving it back only the level for which they paid. So it's not right. the same as people were like, okay, let's, I, I love making this monster suit. And damn it, I'm going to make the best monster suit possible within the parameters I have. I don't think you get a lot of that. Uh, a lot of these effects houses are just either overworked and underpaid. Uh, 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 so you don't, even when you find some discovery, you're always amazed if, if the monster impresses you or or, or the, the effects are, are, are imaginative in some way. They, they, they're not, I think they're not quite getting it. They're not. They're, the spirit of the B movie has is, is not because a lot of times people are making these movies to audition to make bigger films, right? Instead of just trying to make a great little movie, and that's why when they do come along, they so impress us monster kids. Like, oh, that one got it. Yeah, you know, you know it's it's like a cynicism instead of a sincerity. Yeah, a sincerity mm -hmm. to it. You know, like, and you're right. I mean, because you're right. You, the people who made us stuff in the past that we love, they were just trying to make a cool movie. Yeah, they were still trying to make a buck, and they maybe were trying to move up the ladder in the, the business, but they still just gave it a more sincere try somehow. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. get your standouts. You go, I mean, a movie that I really enjoy <laughs> is a film called Pontypool. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, it was based on a radio show. The premise is that people are all of a sudden turning into homicidal maniacs, and it's because. They are affected by hearing certain words. It's just a word so virus. clever. A word yeah. virus. <laughs> yeah, words yeah. are turning people into zombies, basically. Yeah, it's interesting. And most of it takes place in this radio studio. Great characters. Stephen McCaddy's brilliant. So it is possible to get a small, clever film out there. It's just not easy. Yeah, I just the, I think the biggest challenge for filmmakers. Because everybody can make a movie and everybody is, and there's so much quantity, how how do you get your film noticed and seen? Yeah. That's the biggest yeah. challenge, I think. All these films that we're talking about, they had distribution in place. I mean, they all did. They were all made by people. They were even financed, and they knew when they you, you, you see the shooting dates, and then they were released like four weeks later. You know, I mean, it's like they knew these films were on a path. Now people are finishing these films and. And then they then they themselves are uploading them through an aggregator to to Tubi and hoping they're going to get a check for a dollar fifty. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. Strange world, you know, it's a strange, it is a strange time world. To try to figure out how do you make money on this right now. What some places would do, like, do you remember there was a series on the Sci Fi Channel when they would say, "We'll just create the most ridiculous title," like like with Sharknado. You guys remember when Sharknado sure, was sure. the big thing? And okay. that would be considered a B film. You get some actors that you know were somewhat successful on TV. You put them all together where they work only like three days, and the visual effects aren't the greatest. But how what a ridiculous concept, you know? Maybe sharks, sharks. And, yeah, Maybe and giant octopus. You well, know. it it just it just went on and on and on, and I, I guess you know that has its own cult following. Mm -hmm. I guess. But yeah, it's a different is, kind of thing. Yeah, it is because, you know, Sean, the thing for me is, is again, like with the sharks and the tornado, it's a CGI thing. Getting back to like a physical, I want the physical shark. Mm -hmm. I, want yeah, the, yeah. I want I want the, again, it just makes me feel like someone went through the trouble of mm -hmm. making a creature yeah. or making something. And to me, that's, and I that's think, what I know, really love about it. And any pop culture has, always, has changed so much where genre films especially now are no longer looked at in a, in a derisive way you know well, right I mean, now no. as we've said many times now the nerds you know run hollywood uh, yes. for better or worse but i mean it's it's true like and 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 as we said to like the way like you know sam markoff and Inter american international pictures and roger corman they would make these drive-in movies for teenagers but then eventually and especially now all the big studios are making the drive-in films, you know, like with, with Jaws and yeah. Star Wars, so people really, oh, just pure escapist. I mean, a $100 million drive-in movies. That's, yeah. what, that's what we have now, you know, which is kind of against the whole point, but that's, it's just, it's good and bad. I will say that now with the digital age, we can have these movies come out on Blu-ray remastered and to see them in beautiful, you know, formats 
with all these extras and these commentaries and th these obscure little movies that we struggled to stay up for at late night as the kids. And now we can really see in the most beautiful presentations possible. It's like a new rebirth of some of these B movies in that way yeah. for us, at least yeah. as collectors and fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I was I was used to joke that like it's like a terrible movie, like, or let's say Godzilla versus Megalon, it'd be like, well, I'm waiting for the Criterion, and that used to be a joke. Now there is a Criterion of Godzilla versus Megalon. <laughs> I know it's yeah. incredible. <laughs> People have said, well, uh, physical media is dead. You know, no one's doing that anymore. I I would argue that you know there are fans out there who like the physical media, and it means a lot when a company like Film Masters, for example, Absolutely. that can take a a classic film, an older film, and go through the process of cleaning it up, whether it's finding yeah. the original negative or digitally like a new uh, light. cleaning it up. So it's, yes. So, and I mean, because some of these things, when you can see them on Blu-ray, things pop out that you didn't sure, see Sure, they look before. like real movies now. You know, like, wow. like Larry and Steven, you were saying, when we were kids, we were watching these films, you know, on the green TV, TV set. Some of these films I've seen now on Blu-ray, I'm like, oh, I, I didn't know that was in the corner or there were some things that pop out. If yeah. it's on Blu-ray, they gone through the process of cleaning it up. And I love that. So to me, it's almost like seeing these films in a new mm -hmm. light. And I, I applaud companies like film masters well, also, also, that are doing this stuff that, and keeping these films, uh, putting out there into the world, best version of that film possible. Also seeing it with the proper aspect ratio, you know, part of when we started watching movies in the fifties on TV and I remember going to NYU and, and, and films are still being shown on TVs that were Academy Standard, the square screens. They were like, yeah, the thing I like about old movies is there's so much, all this headroom. What's all this headroom? And what's nice is that watching these films that when they were in the theaters, they were 185, particularly 50s films, obviously. And then they were, they were shown open mat for TV. So you saw all this extra room on the top of their head and the bottom. And you, it almost looks like it, 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 an unintended, effect it has on a kid it's like oh the movies look a little these movies look a little different we, but we don't understand why until we become cineasts and then someone puts out which is what i love is they'll they'll put out a 50 sci-fi or horror movie in the proper aspect ratio now we're seeing these directors are actually better mm -hmm. than we gave them credit for they did compose the yeah. images correct you know with, right. without this extra Excellent. We're getting choices. You know? I mean, we're getting choices. I just, I, I was looking at with Devil's Partner, for instance. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Do I want to watch the, you know, the extra headroom and see what's up and down there? Or do I want to watch the uh, the theatrical, you know? So it's it's interesting to actually have the choice and yes. try to decide like which is, you know, there's debate about, well, that's better. Well, that's better. But I don't know. I, 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 there's something to be said for both, I think. Yeah, to yeah. have the options is fantastic. But you can't use, you know, you, it's it's a dangerous thing to mess with a monster kid's memories. I remember I was just on some Facebook group and they were talking about that box, some box set from uh, that Universal put out of the sci-fi films of the 50s that had Incredible Shrinking Man, the mole people, all this stuff on there. Mm. And I said, yeah, you know, but he watched some of those. Just make sure you, you, you do your settings and punch in because, um, you know, the, they're showing them full frame. That isn't how they were, that would have been in theaters. I got some guy on there like, what are you talking about? Like this, <laughs> that version he fell in love with was somehow not right. And I, I we just try to explain it to him technically about Academy, Academy Standard versus opening open mat, the frames one It was never shown that way. Dude, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, wow. okay, bye. <laughs> right, right, right. Are, are yeah. you sure? Are you sure that wasn't me in that class? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like an impression of me. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and, and when it comes to the Japanese films, I know that there is a love. I know we all have it for as much as I love to watch these Godzilla films in the original Japanese language and how beautiful and you're getting the actual film that was shown in Japan. I have a love for these dubbed versions yeah I, yeah yeah i like both. Having, having both options yeah. yeah yeah right well that's why that's what's nice about the new one is actually it's pretty spare on dialogue so you 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 are still captured with godzilla minus one in the transporting nature of the visual universe you're not constantly looking down like on shin godzilla part of what's what the, the release of shin godzilla which which is a fun movie but it's also like uh, like a lot of recent godzilla movies it's all about uh the diplomacy and bureaucracy of, of the Japanese governments. There's a lot of dialogue scenes. So you're constantly looking down at the dialogue scene. So the second time I watched 
I saw, that's how I saw it in the theater when I got the Blu-ray and watched it here as the rev up to going to see Godzilla Minus Hero. I said, you know what? I'm going to watch the English dub. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, I do I, love I, that movie, though. Yeah, yeah I me just, too. <laughs> I mean, I talked to Peter Bogdanovich about this. He was talking about he wasn't particularly the biggest fan of silent cinema, and he doesn't find himself going as mu as much as he loves and, and admires foreign cinema. You know, he does, he does like a lot of us, uh, this unspoken thing among cineasts, we don't want our eye to drift from the face of the actor. Mm -hmm. And and to, to just glance down, it's a it's 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 a it's a thing not everyone wants to do. You know, that's why I think Fellini is such a popular filmmaker for for us here in the u.s because there isn't tons of dialogue in fellini movies there are visuals that just flow over you you're not just locked into having to read but you know that's enough that's for another conversation guys this has been so great we could go on and on and oh, on. Yes, we you guys are such great you're like guests. In, I kindred mean, uh, spirits yeah I, I just i just love love this i mean thank you guys so much for being with us um absolutely this has really meant a lot but I know you guys are are busy. You have your own careers. Can you tell me, is there stuff that you're working on now? You could let our listeners know what to look for from you. Well, I will talk about the book, but Larry, why don't, why don't you take this first and then I'll talk, uh, I'll tell them what we worked on together. Yeah. Well, I want to, I, I, I got to mention Steve did a great job of putting together giant beast cinema and it was so much fun to be a part of that. He, he picked some great people and uh, I, I, I got a choice of some choice movies, which was great. Mm. So uh, that was just a, a really uh, terrific thing. Uh, I'm developing a uh, an absurdist comic strip called Flapjack Alley. It's like retro and <laughs> parallel universe at the same time. And uh, other than that, I'm, I'm starting on a painting binge. So I'm going to be painting wow. and probably doing some more stuff to do with my Steam Wars project, uh, which has there's a Steam Wars graphic novel available now, and uh, there'll be more. Steam Wars things in the future. Thanks for having me, guys. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, and your it's artwork is beautiful, you. by the way. It's just yes. gorgeous. And, and, and are you are you posting any of that? If if someone wanted to see your paintings, where would someone have to go? Oh yeah, uh, uh, SteamWars.com. That's the easiest way. And uh, and I'm on f Facebook and Twitter, so you know I'm always posting uh, artwork on there too, including surrealist stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome, Fantastic. Larry. And Steve, Stephen, what are you working on? Well, we, Larry and I just did this book, which uh, a giant beast cinema, which covers, I think, about thirty-three. It's a it's a follow up to a book that I was just a writer on. I wrote two chapters for a giant bug cinema, which reached number one on Amazon for horror movie books. I came in at the ninth hour or twelfth hour, whatever hour is the last hour. I came in. <laughs> And wrote two chapters for they weren't happy with one chapter. So I wrote I, uh, that they had had from another author. And it was like 28 movies, 26 writers. It was very unwieldy, the guy who edited it and mixed results in terms of the article. So I wrote two. Then when it did so well, I said, well, why don't we do a book that's not just about giant bugs from the 30s, 40s, 50s? Actually, it goes to the end of the Monster Kid era, this arbitrary year of 1968, with the idea that there'll be a giant bug cinema Two that takes you through the, the 70s, <laughs> 80s, the 90s. But I said, why don't we do one that's not about giant bugs? And 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 he came up with the title of Mark Bailey, my co-editor on this, Giant Bee Cinema, that kind of covers everything that's giant that isn't a bug. So I actually took this giant beast, the new one, I'm an editor on. I put the writing team together. for. Uh, I reached out to Larry. Fortunately, he said yes. He did five chapters. So we have, it's it's six of us. We all did uh, five movies. I, I had to pick up the slack because it didn't quite even out. So I did eight. And everybody, it was it was great to be an editor on this. First time actually leaning in uh, on a, something professional uh, with my love. Although I've done some commentary tracks in terms of monster movies. This was my first. I uh, And it just was a blast. Uh, it's, it's available now on Amazon as also on Bear Manor Media's website. I'm a big fan of that. I'm also... Working, on, I did a graphic novel called Stoker and Wells that was mentioned on the show about oh. a forty a grumpy forty-something theater manager named Bram Stoker meeting a twenty-something screw-up named H.G. Wells, which is who they were at the time, and how they go on a shared adventure that leads to the creative inspiration for both writers' first great work, The Time Machine and Dracula. And that did well. I'm developing as a TV show with the former president of Marvel Studios on his new new company. And now we just did a, a crowdfunding for the second 
book called Stoker and Wells, The Ashes of Revenge, which is the, the uh, so I'm in the middle of nice. writing and, and working with my artists on that. I'm also, in terms of the B-movie world, I'm writing a biography of someone who did a Larry Blamire movie, Trail of the Screaming Forehead, H.M. Winant, who uh, has had a, a 50, 60 year career. He's 97 now. A lot of you may know him from the Howling Man episode of The Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. He became a dear friend in the 90s when he started in a play uh, that I wrote and produced out here. And he's become like family, he, he and his wife, like family to me. But he got his debut in, in Sam Fuller's Run of the Arrow with uh, Rod Steiger and, and Charlie Bronson. He's been in Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. So you've oh. seen town. He, he, you know, he was the villain in Elvis's, uh, it happened at the World's Fair. So I'm writing his memoirs with him and that's going to come oh, out shortly. That's great. It's fine out of the Howling Man, the Twilight Zone, which is You Must Believe. So it's called H.M. Wine and You Must Believe. Uh, that's awesome. The stories I'm getting from him about his, his life, not only in, in, in Playhouse 90s he did with directors like Frankenheimer and Franklin J. Schaffner and all the actors, but he did. He had a 10, 10 12 year stint in, in Broadway beforehand, being directed by Olivier and, and working with Catherine Hepburn and wow. just wow. Lot, and did doing live TV during the day and taking the train up to do your your show at night. It just I'm, I'm just the, it's going to be a great record of just a life in the theater and early days of television at that time. So that and just pet, you know, happy the writer strike is over, peddling new projects. Uh, that's pretty much what's what's going on on my side of town. Well, awesome. I'm I, I'm hoping that we can have you guys back again. We, yes. we have to have you guys so back. You, yeah. you guys, you guys got to come over because uh, I have oh, the oh, I have the yeah. Howling Man on sixteen millimeter. Uh, oh. Yes, yes, nice. but of course, if Matt invites you over at seven p.m., don't be there at seven p.m. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. just wanted to put hey, that 7 out. Seven oh two. Yeah, just yeah, just let you know. <laughs> anybody out here what's oh, are you all out here who's out here we're, we're all we're all we're yeah. all we're all west, west coast, coast. Yeah. yes wow <laughs> dude I, I i'm also a big 16 millimeter collector I'm a super eight kid when i was a kid and then then in in 05 i think it was i wandered over to a flea market on melrose and saw an old bell and howl 16 i went i'll buy that and then i went on ebay and bought it next thing i knew now i have about 65 features and i have movie nights ah. Um, yeah, me too. You're just, you're just you like are Matt. one of us, man. Yeah, Matt yeah, has a, this amazing collection of trailers, uh, oh, Saturday cartoon. morning cartoon stuff. He's got, uh, you've got cartoons I've outer never limits. seen. Yes. Lots of outer limits. Uh, great, great stuff. You have the Howling Man on 16 millimeter, and you're based in LA. Yeah. Well, we got to do it. You know, HM's 97. He's not getting any younger. We got to do an event. Dude, oh my God! It. Yes, let's yeah. do it. Hey, that's so, so yeah, cool. I, that's, if, yeah, if we you, have if to. If you need together. that print, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. So <laughs> duly noted, and we'll try to figure it out for sure. Well, oh, guys, sure. I want, I want to thank you so much for being with. Uh, yeah, Boston this was Party great. Yeah. Yeah. thank you for reaching out thrill. to us, and thank you for sending the PDF of the book too. Yeah, no, so I, I loved it. I loved. <laughs> it. Yeah, it's really, a, it's very easy read. It's like it's, I mean, it's, it's all the stuff we love, you know. Yeah, but what what I really want is I got to order it on Amazon. So mm -hmm. I can have it myself yeah. physically. Physical yeah. copy. Right. 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 Mail it, right. have to mail it right. to you guys so you can sign it. So I can have my <laughs> physical right. signed copy. Right. And so our listeners, you have to check out this book. It's it's yes. giant wonderful. beast cinema. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So let's Thank give you. a toast. To B movies and to Stephen Peros and Larry Blemire. Yeah. Woohoo! Cheers, guys. Time for a listener shout out. Shout, shout out. out. Shout out. You're kind, of, you yeah. kind of emotional about that. Your voice kind of broke up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the new year and you're, you're oh, all sensitive. It's, yes, it's the new year. The new I'm, I'm shout out. So, so touched I get proclaimed. We have so many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yes. Now, uh, this goes out to Randall Perkins, longtime listener from Las Vegas. Yay. Hey, hey, Randall. A.K.A. Percasso the Mundane. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there's nothing mundane about Randall because no. he recently purchased Monster Party merch from our eBay store. All right. Monster Party t-shirt and the legendary Monster Party ball cap. Wow. Yeah. He's, he's nice. ready to hit the town. Stress. <laughs> uh, I don't think this is the first time Randell has purchased. So we Randell, we appreciate your support. We appreciate you being a longtime listener. And, yes, we uh, do. Absolutely. So Thank you, my friend. Yeah. Matt, I think you've got uh, one or two as well. 
I do. Yes. Well, our longtime listener, Brandon Meyer, you remember, mm. I think it was, was it the last episode or maybe the one before that, but we did a shout out for him because he was doing this contest that involves sneakers. He wanted to thank us for doing the shout out. So he sent us a little gift and it's Ooh, a gift yeah. for all of us. And I believe it's some artwork. I haven't opened them. I want I wanted to oh open my them with you guys. So nice. I'm saving them. But he did include a note. And the note reads, Dear best podcast ever. Oh, <laughs> like that. yeah. I, love it I, that one. I, I, I smell Rondo Awards oh, this year. This, <laughs> dude, this guy, man, he, he knows how to make points. <laughs> uh, he says, I have been enjoying your podcast since the beginning and oh, am wow. humbled to have gotten a plug on your last episode in regards to the contest I was competing in. Nice. I didn't advance beyond the quarterfinals, but I still felt like a winner due to the overwhelming support I received during this endeavor. Nice. As a thank you, I have four drawings for you guys, which I hope you enjoy. If uh -oh. the artwork looks similar to anything you've seen, I usually freehand the images I find. He says, no tracing, I swear. Uh, <laughs> thank you again for the terrific content you put out. <laughs> and keep up the great work. Merry oh, belated awesome. Christmas and have a happy new year. Yours scarily. Brandon Meyer. Oh, oh Brandon. You, Brandon. That's, Whoa, that's, terrific. that's awesome. Yes. As you and everyone else now knows, we love gifts. We do. <laughs> we do. A thank you and presents. Nice. So yeah. guess who's in my good books? <laughs> <laughs> and I have another shout out for Ed Martinez. Ed is a mm. longtime listener as well. He right. has worked in the film industry. He's also good friends with a guest we just had on the show, August Ragoni. Yeah. Ah, and, yes. And he would make films as a kid like we did. And he worked with Steve Wang and James. Damon Foster. You know the name of Damon Foster, yes? Sure. I was a, I was a huge fan of Oriental cinema and Asian trash cinema. Yeah, uh, me too. Ah, yes. Yeah. yeah. So Ed knows all these guys. And uh, in the 80s, they did these short films like like we would do. So he did this thing called Ultra Cyborg. And Ed Martinez created the costume and then got August Ragoni and all these people together. Nice. And Damon Foster does this amazing like martial arts work and acrobatics. And uh, so if you go on YouTube... There is a thing called Ultra Cyborg Behind the Scenes and Bloopers. Find nice. this and uh, you will see all this great footage of these young guys doing <laughs> some pretty impressive sort of like uh, low budget John Wick. I mean, <laughs> it's nice. really incredible with uh, costumes and August Ragoni is in it. And you'll see them do all these stunts jumping off of roofs and just incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that creates a real warm space in my heart because the, <laughs> uh, once again, kindred spirits who, hey, let's, you know, get all the friends together and put on okay. a show. But I mean, they took it seriously because you look <laughs> at these fights and someone mapped these things out. This is not just random like I would do, like, oh, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> like this is like common writer Yuan Wu Ping kind of stuff. So nice. uh, check it out. Uh, once again, it's Ultra Cyborg behind the scenes and bloopers on YouTube. Well, if you are interested in the aforementioned Monster Party merch, uh, you know where you can find it on eBay, on our eBay store, which is called Monster Party Store. You guessed it. <laughs> and uh, we've got we've got plenty of the the legendary ball cap. We've got T-shirts. We've got the shot glasses. Uh, we've got the PPE masks. Yes, uh, stock up. Right. Sure. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> stock up. yeah. Get a lot of them. I want you to outdo Larry. I want you to not only get one for just in case, but I want you to get one just in case in case. <laughs> right. Well, you Three. know, it's like you know the the flu season's coming back, and you know. 
you want to make true. sure you yeah, sure. You protect never know. yourself. So, yeah. Yes. A lot of people walking around with masks, so it hasn't gone yeah. away. And you yeah. could use the shot glasses to cover your eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're going to be safe beyond safe. And if you happen to be a Patreon supporter of Monster Party and order from our eBay store, we will throw in free surprise goodies, courtesy of our friends Jason Lindsay and Bifang Pow Toys and creature creator extraordinaire Ted Haynes. I know we've been talking about B-movies, but those guys are A-listers. That's <laughs> they are. They are. Now, I, Patreon, I, I know that we hmm. refresh my memory because my, my head now is full of all these B movies uh, details. <laughs> sure. And I just you know, completely forgotten what this Patreon thing is all about. Can you enlighten me, please? All right. Well, one of the films that was mentioned in passing is Attack of the Crab Monsters. Right. And much like a crab monster <laughs> is able to use telepathy to enter your brain, Monster right. Party uses Patreon to enter your brain and exactly. provide it with bonus Monster Party content. And we are talking Ooh. our special audio episodes, our shows like Larry's Toy Time and James's Toy Time and Sean's Toy Time and my Toy Time's coming up. And there are Ooh. Monster Party masterpieces and the video diary of our trip to Japan and Ooh. the story collections that my stepfather-in-law, John Bordeaux, puts together of vintage sci-fi and horror. And uh, my God, am I forgetting anything? Uh, I mean, just coverage, conventions? convention coverage. Convention there covers. you go. There's so much now that I lose track of it. That's how much you're going to get. And we never take anything down. It's all there. We just keep adding to it. So you can get in there and just wade in that bonus content. Yeah. <laughs> Indulge. Wow. Yes. So that sounds like that sounds like a wealth of content, but I don't know. I'm I'm saving up to buy multiple copies of Giant Beast Cinema. So I'm not sure I can really afford this luxury. Okay, for the amount of money that I charge for my autograph at the average car and boat show, <laughs> you can become a Monster Party patron. And that amount is five dollars. Five dollars wow. a month. That's impressive. Right. I mean, I mean, you can't get like a knockoff marionette of the giant claw for that price. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's basic. No, you can't. But I wish, uh, right? Oh, yes. Oh, we well, all that's, need that's, that. that. I, anyone can afford that. How do, how do I sign up for this Patreon? Well, all you got to do is you go to patreon.com, you go to Monster Party, you click the join button, you follow the instructions, and next thing you know, you'll have so much Monster Party content to get through. You may have to get rid of a few of your more needy friends. <laughs> <laughs> And speaking of needy friends, we are also on social media. You can find Monster Party on Facebook at Monster Party TV, YouTube, Monster Party TV, Twitter, our handle at Monster Party HQ, and Instagram is also Monster Party HQ. And uh, hey, wherever you're listening to us, uh, whatever platform, please find a way to write us a review. Let us know your thoughts. We would love to hear them, and we will read them on the air. But when we read it, it'll be printed very small so we can pretend <laughs> that we're Bow Bridges from Village of the Giants. Of course, then we'll need a Joy Harmon. So, listeners, <laughs> any takers? On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Stroth. And I'm James Gonis. Keep America strong! And keep those B-movies alive. And if you happen to see a slightly unrealistic T-Rex smoking a cigarette, he's on break from shooting the Unknown Island sequel. <laughs> There's Larry. Hi, Larry. Hello there. Hey, Hello, Matt gentlemen. Weinhold. Matt and, and James. And that's James. And, and James. Matt, and James, Sean, and Larry, right? Matt, James, Sean, and Larry. <laughs> <laughs> if I, if I make Why didn't we song, record that happened. song? <laughs> Matt, oh, really? James, Sean, and Larry. Yeah. I scat, so, Cat you know, <laughs> that'll help. Catman Weinhold. <laughs> uh, we have, oh, wait a minute. Sean's here now. There's only 10 All more right. people showing up here. 
Uh, <laughs> let's see. Here we go. Here is Sean, but he's we're getting his. Oh, and there's Larry. There. Okay. The other Larry. Two the other Larry. Larry. Ah, the other Larry. I knew it. I knew it. I knew there had to be one somewhere. <laughs> we always somewhere. we always keep a spare. <laughs> There's been rumors floating about another Larry for years. <laughs> Someday. I didn't believe it, but yeah. No. There he is. Larry. <clears throat> hey, Larry and Larry. We have Larry Stroth. We have Sean Sheridan. We have James hey Gonis. I'm Matt Weinhold. We got Larry. Matt, James, Sean, Sean and Larry. Sean and Larry. It is. Every now and it is. <laughs> so Stephen is with us, but we don't have his sound and we have a picture. Okay. okay. <laughs> maybe his so, audio is not uh, enabled. Maybe he could text yeah, he, us his comments. He does this. He does this late entrance thing. It's <laughs> yeah, you have, a, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. has to make a. No, yeah, yeah, Larry, um, yeah, Larry's very professional. Very professional. <laughs> That's uh, great. So. Thanks. Nobody comes to a party early, so right. You know what? You know, if you're invited to a party and you're supposed to, it says 7 p.m., you show up at 7 p.m. No, you don't. I, no, yes, that's you a, do. That's a no, bad no, idea. No, it's, no, it's, no. You are, not, you are not, the not worst party goer. Oh, okay, okay, not in so, Hollywood. Okay, so in other words, when you say, oh, the party starts at 7 p.m., you're lying. You're lying. Yes, Why not I put am. 8 p.m.? I am, I am Larry. I'm that's lying. That's bullshit, Matt. That's bullshit. Wow. This, so, don't put... Don't don't invite so me over. Other to Larry, Larry. Okay, Larry. Uh, other just Larry. Here, here's a here's just a <laughs> tiny uh, piece of what you're in store for. <laughs> oh yeah. no, he's mad. I know. That's how we feel as no. well. <laughs> okay, so it looks like Stephen sent a message saying new computer. Oh, okay. Okay. Connecting. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well. Okay. We'll, yeah. We'll, we're good. That's that's why starting a little bit earlier <laughs> is good. But um, that's right. So so, so Larry, how do you Larry. feel about how do you feel about going to a party? early you don't do that right no 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 okay. no no that's, no, well, that's, that's not good, good. That's, 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 that's not good that's bad no. form that's, no, it that's is. really awkward that's really awkward i've had that, that happen question. though yes yes because you know larry's big in hollywood so he knows he goes to all these big parties and stuff you, you, <laughs> no, yeah hollywood. yeah uh, i like to be 40 seconds late no one ever expects that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true <laughs> right in the middle second the 40 second edge i call it <laughs> <laughs> i like it Hey, I got look, figured, man. all I'm saying is if you have a party and you put a time, 7 p.m., you shouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised if someone shows up at 7 I'm not p.m. You don't have, no. you know, it's like there's a knock on the door. Who the fuck is that? <laughs> what, what are they doing here yeah, at 7 p.m.? Well, yeah. guess what? Your invite says 7 p.m. So don't, don't lie. Don't, you know, say like if you well, want to be not later, really a lie, Larry. What, yes, what it is, is yes, it is. What it is, is what what it is, what is really, what is it? it's, it's one of those things that like when you're having a party, you're always running a little bit late. So you kind of hope Are that you? people will. Yes, of course. Yes. There's always last minute things to do. Put out yeah. the ice. You go, oh, yeah. the canapes, you know. And right. Right. Hey, yeah. Here's the thing. What, if everybody comes <clears throat> at exactly seven o'clock, if it is seven o'clock. What's going to have that? What that crush at the doorway is going to be? Impossible. Yeah, that's true. It'll be chaos. It could be. Right? You, you got to hire a guy. You know, the ballets that go crazy. Yeah. Oh, oh the like all the cars. I hate jostling. Oh, oh, I know. <laughs> oh! Did someone mention cars? Yes. What's the worst thing about something like this? Parking. Parking. You see, yes. do you remember, Larry? We did a show about what if you had your own movie studio. And everyone talks about what they like. And one of the things that I say is I want parking. Everyone laughs because, <laughs> hey, Good parking, every yeah. shoot that I do, every project I do, it's like parking is always an issue. If I had plenty of parking, my God, my life would be so much easier. <laughs> I'm glad you got this off true. your chest. So, so that's our show. So thank no, you for no, joining no. us, Steve and Larry. I thought that parking oh, thing was going to be controversial, but we're all no. with it. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, See, I, I guess can't argue with that. No, yes, no. Larry. Yes, yes. I want no, to thank don't, you all for don't patronize me, Sean. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to move on. I'm trying to move on from the party we were, theme. Thought we uh, Larry, Larry really Blamir. Are we, are we Larry Blamir, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, so you're on East Coast, right? I am on the East Coast, but that is as far as I can go with that. You understand the uh. protection <laughs> thing is still in effect. I got it. <laughs> gotcha. All right. And Larry, what well, is this? What is the illustration behind you? I don't recognize that. It's very cool. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's, uh, it's one of my Steam Wars paintings from my uh, Steam Wars. Nice. Project. Wow. Nice. That's beautiful. 
I'm a painter in another life, which happens to unfortunately be the same life, which means I'm doing a lot of different things all the time. <laughs> well, well, of cool. course, we'll get into this in the show, but uh, you've, yes, yes. Uh, you wear many hats. Yes. I do, and uh, I only have one head, so it's a problem. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I've got a revolving door of muses, and and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm you know, I'm writing, I'm I'm uh, I'm painting, I'm making a comic strip, I'm doing commentary tracks, or I'm looking at Steve Peros. Hello, oh, there he goes. Yes. Yay! Success. Let the <laughs> games begin. All right. <laughs> got a a new macbook i did all the test microphone it showed me it, it i heard myself and then when you guys maybe join nothing would unmute literally the red bar is still there so i this is my obviously my phone uh it's pretty good though black. it's pretty good yeah it, looks good. It, it was it was the zoom gremlins that got you yes. for that. <laughs> and, and, and i, I are, love your yes. i love your gargantuas poster gargantuas yeah. uh Beautiful. yes that's awesome this is this is a uh, french uh Three sheet or something. Nice. Where That's sweet. Fonda name is misspelled as Ishiro Fonda. Oh my gosh! That's <laughs> oh. awesome. Different. Yeah, the wow. Fondas are a very talented family. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's interesting. <laughs> this is sort of the first pass at like on Golden Pond. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's awesome. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thank us, you so though. much yeah. for making I mean, this. Hey Steve, I wanted to ask you like how. Because I know you, you know, you re reached out on Facebook. How did you initially come to know about us? Well, I wanted to get the word out about our book, about uh, Giant Beast Cinema. And so mm -hmm. I was like, who, who has the coolest, the best, the most <laughs> uh, viewed, the, the most dazzlingly handsome, you know, all those things. <laughs> oh, enough said. Oh, yeah. Most, most a lot of eye candy in this group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, That's awesome. So I reached out and uh, and thank you for uh, picking it up. I actually am going to go grab my charger for the phone because now, of course, it's giving me the the low. Okay, the low. go for it. Not a not a problem. Talk amongst yourselves for just a minute or two. <laughs> we will. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're having a blast. Yeah. That poster is awesome. That is so. I don't great. think yeah. I, I don't think I've seen that one before. That's really cool. I haven't seen it either. It's not yeah, I, I I have a tie. <laughs> I guess it would be like a half sheet size, a tie one yeah, yeah. that I got. So it was one of those things where I was at Monster Palooza. Russ Tamlin is there, and I bring this poster to him. And, and <laughs> on this poster, they've got him painted very nicely, but it doesn't quite look like him. And so he looks at this poster and he goes, That just doesn't look like me. And I said, It does look like you if you were Asian. And that's <laughs> that's what they did with this oh, yeah. poster. They gave yeah. him a little kind of an Asian look. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that's really interesting. Like, hey, we got to sell this to the masses. Right, right. Absolutely. Uh, Type posters said, are beautiful. Usually. For the as I said, there are two kinds of people in this world: people who love war, the gargantuas, and really horrible people. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and Frankenstein conquers the world. To me, that is like the yeah, Godfather yeah. one and two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, one could argue Fra Frankenstein conquers the world is actually the better film. Uh, in, in terms of pace, uh, uh, elegance, a little, there's even there's art to it. I don't know that there's sure. much, but there's art, but it's but War of the Gargantuals is is an awful lot of fun. Yeah, uh, yeah oh, for more sure. emotional, I think too. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, and uh, really. before we get started here, Stephen, I just want to say I'm a big fan of the cat's meow. And thank yeah, you, me too. And <clears throat> that must have been what an incredible time because I know this is a genre show. But uh, mm -hmm. just for a second, if you could talk about the cast, the director, I mean, if you love cinema, that's like your dream movie. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and and uh, it it was something I wrote literally I, I'd written right out of NYU. I was uh, in a history of silent film class with the late, great William K. Everson. And he mentioned uh, Charlie Chase short. And he said, of course, this was made by Thomas Sins. Of course, you all know how he died. And we didn't even know who he was, let alone how he died. And. And he said, oh, he was, he was murdered on the host yacht. It was all sh hushed up. You can read about it. It's out there. And I always <laughs> remember, and I did some, then I just started researching it. And I thought how fascinating crossroads everyone was at over those two days. Two years out of school, it got optioned by the people who were producing the doors. And I thought, oh my God, I've made it. I've made it. And <laughs> I know that then, feeling. <laughs> bleeding. <laughs> and then we are fully financed. <clears throat> Really investor pool, and it turns out that the 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 money was it wasn't worth the the 
the uh, letter of credit wasn't worth the paper it was written on. It all fell apart. Oh, geez. Years later, I, it was a script that wouldn't die, no matter somebody would option it, and then they're good. They go out of business. Someone, uh, <laughs> someone would option it and have a stroke, and then, and then I said, well, let me turn it into a stage play because I knew someone who had the money to always like the screenplay, and I said maybe that'll be a pathway to the film getting made. Oh, that's interesting. Oh wow! So what, a script to to play to script to play. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was a screenplay. So, so I always think those smug reviewers who said it betrays its stage origins, you know, that, <laughs> uh, uh, right, uh, right. Well, uh, no, nope. always a screenplay. Uh, and then the play did very well out here. Uh, got wonderful reviews because everyone was doing these kind of depressing, grungy, you know, plays in LA and in, in, in 99 seat equity waiver. And here we did this one. We had like 14 critics opening night. Uh, so it, it did very well. And that it did actually do what we wanted, which was it reinvigorated interest in the screenplay. Producer got it to uh, Peter Bogdanovich. Um, which is amazing. A, a, an incredible experience in my life, chapter in my life, working with him on it. Um, I, you know, Despite anything you might read about Peter, who passed away two years ago to the day today, he been to the uh the zenith and the dear of him, his life professionally and personally and when i met him as anyone who watches any interviews with him online in the last 10 15 years of his life maybe 20 years of his life actually very humbled man uh very mm -hmm. uh, self-effacing uh no, no, he did not shake his confidence as to his abilities and talents and decisions but uh, but we had a great time working together i i sat next to him the whole shoot in germany and greece Worked with wow. him, with the actors. So it was the the optimal situation for a screenwriter on a set, which is usually they take the script and they say, "Bye, we'll see you at the premiere." Maybe. And <laughs> in this case, I was actively involved, so it was an extraordinary, extraordinary experience for me for my life. And also awesome. that cast. I mean, you couldn't yeah. find a better group. Edward Herman as Hurst is just yeah. like he brings everything. The tortured. The soul within him is just on yeah. display throughout that movie. And uh, everyone's great. I mean, Eddie is yeah. it's fantastic. Uh, yeah. Joanna Lumley, my God. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? All the wrong actors got out of the way so the right ones could do that. <laughs> great. We had a cast that excited Lionsgate. Uh, we had um, Christopher Plummer for Hearst. We had Matthew Broderick for Ince. Drew Barrymore for Marion. Mm. Oh, Rosie O'Donnell for Luella Parsons. Hmm. Uh, and then timing, wow. no one could do it. Then once we got Kirsten on, that was this 18 year old. She's she brilliant. actually the decision. They said, okay, we're officially green lining it with the cast. You actually don't have to have a star Hearst. We kept going through these star names after Christopher Plummer said, you know what, guys, I'm, I'm a million years old. I've made seven movies this year. Uh, now that you guys have scheduled it for the holidays, I just can't do it. And so he, he got, so they let us go to just someone who was right for the job. And I remember Carol Lewis, the producer, who was also a wonderful casting director, said, what do you think of Edward Herman? And I said, I literally, when I wrote this 10 years ago, had Edward Herman in my head, but I, I was, wow. he was too young. Now at the time, oh, wow. was 59, <laughs> Hearst was 62. So the age difference between Marion uh, Marian and Hearst are, is the same between Ed Herman and Kirsten Nunn. They're both like three years younger than the character was at the time so it worked out being i mean at one point we we had marlon brando wanted to do it and oh my gosh <laughs> he would have been such an age difference and so, so would christopher Plummer actually imposed a bigger age yeah. difference than it was on the part and it wanted just ed herman just he was hired i think 10 days before he had to show oh. up on set such a pro oh, such, such a history buff amazing to work <laughs> all these actors are so amazing there so as, as a director myself I just learned the difference between everybody's technique and watched Peter as he handled everybody exactly as they needed to be handled. This actor needed line readings. He gave him line readings. This one needed to be coddled. He coddled him. This one wanted to just talk endlessly about the script. He talked endlessly about the, whatever they needed. He took care of his actors like I've never seen anyone on a set. He knew that they were the most important thing. That's who everybody sees. Got to give, yeah. got to give them, right. you know, it was amazing. That's awesome. Well, if you don't know this film, you have to check it out. It's one of those stories that I heard about forever for years. This yeah, this Hollywood, Hollywood legend. 
legend and you know <laughs> what's the truth behind it and this explores this scandal i don't want to give too much away really at all if you're not familiar with it look up the film look up the story in, in a nutshell it's about a, a a murder that may or may not have happened on william randolph Horace yacht in, in the roaring 20s uh i know it's on tubi it's been on it, it goes on it cycles on and off amazon prime it's uh, it's it's in a lot of places uh and uh, very proud of the film thank you guys for for the shout out on it well, you got this, is, this is this is great. This is terrific that we've talked about this. But you know, for us to start our show, we need to focus on the B movie. <laughs> now thing. let's and talk I, about I, uh, I, the I, giant I, claw. I know. So, Hello, Larry, Stephen, I, I don't know if you're familiar with us, Larry. What what are you holding up there? I know of you guys. Well, we're on the same. We're on a couple of the same Blu-rays, aren't you? On <laughs> yes, oh, that's right. uh, yes, we're on the yeah. Devil's. Oh, you you got your we're... Devil's partner. Ours are ours are coming, right? Yeah. Hey, here we <laughs> go. You, you, Sean, you'll get yours tomorrow. Oh, oh, man! <laughs> awesome. yeah. Thank I you, know. Larry. We have we are we're sharing. That's right. We're sharing a Blu-ray commentary of discs now. That's awesome. Yeah. You know what, uh, Larry? Larry, just come over. Just I not only know. We, I have that T-shirt in my your your Monster Party T-shirt. I was given it as a. As a prize, I think at some screening where I answered. Really? Wow! Wow! That's amazing. <laughs> really? Oh my god! That's hilarious. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, quick, quick question: What what year did you graduate NYU? Eighty eight. Unless I'm trying to get a job, in which case I graduated <laughs> in ninety. No, uh, eighty eight. Eighty eight. Uh, I was I was two years. Uh, I was eighty six. Oh, okay, great. And I, I had nice. that. I had that same class with William Everson. Wasn't he extraordinary? He was, was extraordinary. Awesome. You know, guys, he he had his own silent films, you know, his own collection of 16s that he would project, and they were mo almost entirely double wow. sprock, means there was no soundtrack. And you'd look in the back of the room, and he, he had one of those little AV classroom uh, records. Oh, yeah. And he'd be back there with his tie and his jacket, like a little DJ. And he'd, he'd put... <laughs> he he'd... he'd put the score together for you. It was, it was wow. amazing. But Steven, wow. that's the, that is the sign of a great teacher because yeah. what pissed yeah. me off so much is I remember when I was getting my film degree at SF state and the teacher there decided to put on a certain film and there was no music, nothing. And I remember being upset going silent films weren't silent. They always had music. This is wrong. This is, you know, and I made a big stink and they're all, oh, who is that student? You know, luckily I always carried around my one man band gear. So <laughs> right. I was always just ready for any occasion. Steve, uh, we have, I think something else in common. We're both Greek American. Ah, oh, what's your last name? Gonis. Gonis. Wonderful. Yeah. Gonis. Uh, my dad, my dad was a bazooki player in New York and uh, I guarantee that somebody in your family, if they're from New York, he played at their wedding. Well, my father <laughs> was Manny Avis, and he was a band leader, Greek band leader. In my dad knows so New York. he was, wow, you know, wow. They did, no way they didn't. Steve, uh, do you, do you well, know? Any, do you, Steve, do you know any Greek? Uh, I, I like to say polyligo, which means very little. Uh, James, <laughs> now you guys same, can have your same, Greek yeah. Yeah, my, <laughs> You're much better than that, James. You know my, more my, Greek. Well, my father is an was an immigrant. My mom was first generation. They spoke it fluently. But they spoke it to each other. I think they were of that mindset that some immigrants are, which is, oh, we want to make sure they learn English, not realizing that we learn English anyway. Right. Uh, so <laughs> when I was in Greece making the Cats Meow, which which all of the um, all, all of the exterior of the boat was off the coast of Greece because we the base was Germany where we mm. shot it. Uh, it was uh, we shot in uh, half the money was Germany. We had a shoot in Germany, so all the interiors of the of the the yacht were built on a soundstage. And then all of the boat stuff was in Greece. Suddenly, words are coming out that I didn't yeah. know I knew, you know, because <laughs> it, was, it was all buried there. And the actors wanted to hang with me whenever we were eating because I would I would be able to piece <laughs> together how to communicate with people. Uh, the, but, immersion. That's the only way it works is the immersion. If you're actually, you know, yeah. having to. Right. What, what yeah. part of uh, what part of Greece your family from? My father, my father's uh, from uh, Rhodos, the island of Rhodes. Uh, nice. with uh, Guns and Navarone, so right. uh, Ooh, um, nice one of his favorite films, of course, as a result. Great film, so, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, uh, not the Colossus a, of Rhodes, 
Colossus. I was just going to say Colossus of Rhodes. Yeah. <laughs> That's where our minds go. That was Sergio Leone. Sergio Leone before he found voice. Yeah. You know, that Leone style that we came to know, it was. Yeah. It can't be a Sergio Leone movie. <laughs> <laughs> just play the music the, yeah. over it. Yeah. <laughs> the good, bad, and the Steve, ugly. Steven, do you go, I mean, do you go like, do you go to conventions and stuff? Do you go to Comic Con, stuff like that? I do. I went to Comic Con. I've been going to Comic Con since the 90s when you could just walk up to the door. Yeah. You know? us, us too. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So now Those I'm days just, are gone, buddy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it used to be, as a pro, you used to be able to get definitely two, a pass for you and a guest, and you could buy yeah. up to three at a discount. They cut. They slowly cut away at the the discount, and now now you can't get it for you and a guest anymore. Yeah. Uh, and you you can't. There's not even guarantees as a professional anymore to get yeah. in. I mean, it's it's you, ridiculous. Still, you yourself can get a ticket. I don't think that they've taken that away yet as a pro. Yeah, for a guest. Yeah, but but, but that's, your, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I know it's crazy. Yeah, but uh, so I I become a guy who I speak on. I put together panels. And that winds up being like opening this Pandora's box. If they approve your panel, you yes. can get a supply of passes. You get, you know, so then all your friends who couldn't get in, you put them on right. the list. Oh, so, yeah. yeah so. That, that's how I got in last last yeah. year through yeah. the company. Through the <laughs> yeah, company. Right. I worked because we actually got a panel. We're planning yeah. another couple panels. So yeah, exactly. we're hoping we're hoping to do like a monster party panel at some yeah. point. Like, oh, yeah. Well, if you if you want guests on that, I, as you could see, just drop a nickel in me and I never shut up. So if you oh, sure, <laughs> great, great. If you want yes. me on the God, will he shut up? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to that's... be on. Who knows, who knows if I'll get my pass this year? So <laughs> <laughs> I usually get in by somebody smuggles me in a long box. So yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Yeah. yeah, no, we. De- I mean, we definitely have to have you back on the show at some point, yeah. uh, Stephen yeah. and and Larry, and love the book. I really, yeah, really yeah. enjoyed it. I thought all those sure. essays were fantastic. And uh, some yeah. of them got me annoyed, which that just goes to show you <laughs> that's a good book. Tell me which one got, what got you annoyed? I'd love to know. Well, the stuff about Village of the Giants, because I'm a huge <laughs> fan of Village of the Giants. <laughs> and too, I think actually. it's a better movie than it's given credit yeah, for. Just, well, you have to understand, I took the titles I wanted. <laughs> right, I, right. Give the Japanese titles to Brian Solomon, who did the Godzilla FAQ, because I knew he'd do all the, this great research, and he really did, and he loves all the movies that he did. And so everybody, I, and then I made sure I knew Larry loved the Magic Sword, I knew Justin loved Thief of Baghdad, Justin Humphreys, and I knew I, I wanted a woman to write Attack of the Fifty Foot Woman. So then they kind of each got a list, like you got to pick four from this list. So Justin said, "All right, I'll do I'll do Village of the Dead. I don't love the movie." But if I can, if I if my twist could be uh, doing it on uh, the composer uh, J- uh, Jack Nietzsche. Jack Nietzsche, yeah. Mm. yeah. So I actually had to dial him down. I said, "This got to be a book. Uh, I want everybody to be honest, but I don't want anybody to not want to see the movie." So I dialed down a couple of his. Uh, oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> nice. I used to I used to have that on sixteen millimeter, and wow, uh, yeah, I I love that movie, and it's and I think it's yes, the music is wonderful, but yes. I also think that there's a lot of really clever, bizarre things that happen in it, you know, right down to the, uh, the giant bow bridges legs, you know, <laughs> yeah, which are like, a, like this. I love all that <laughs> stuff. You know? like, I love and then, that. The, and then the, you know, the bow Brummels and the yeah. ducks dancing to the bow Brummels. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. And, I, I want to know what happened. Howard? Yeah. I want to know what happened to the giant chess piece that, that the guy yeah, is hanging well, on. Is that, is that Where is still that? Exists? Where yeah. is that? I and want that. Joy Bob Harmon Burns probably had God. it at some point. <laughs> but Bert, Bert Gordon, Bert Gordon uh, you know, he we, we cover like five of his movies in this book alone, and in Giant, but that doesn't even include the Giant Bug movies that he did. Yeah, and he's a much better and more diverse director than people give him credit for because he also some of his best movies don't even have monsters like Tormented with Richard. Yeah, Carl, oh, yeah. Is great movie. Awesome. Oh uh, yes, Picture Mommy Dead is uh, is yeah. Uh, yeah. What was that? His sniper movie with Chuck Connors and uh, uh, oh Mad- yeah, the police the police story yeah, the or Mad something. Bomber. Mad Bomber, yeah, that's Mad a Bomber. gritty. That you would never guess that was Bird Eye Gordon. But also yeah. speaking of the Magic Sword, that movie looks quite lavish yeah. and quite good for the tiny budget he obviously had. Yeah. It's colorful. Every dime it's got- went on screen. <laughs> yeah, it looks that that's 
a really like he made a an actual like lavish fantasy film on yeah. on, on, on the budget of like you know uh war of the colossal beast i mean it's crazy <laughs> yeah i love no, it he, i love it there's some terrific terrific stuff in here but yeah i always i wondered i remember even my we have a co-editor who was actually the who was reading stuff for um all the spelling and grammar and all that stuff and I was reading it more for content, but even he wrote back to me about Village of the Giants. Is there anything he likes about this movie? <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> and then he said, and then when he went into this thing about how the beach movies are so much funnier, and I was like, are they really? I mean, yeah, in, in small doses, <laughs> yes. But yeah, 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 to try to sit through all those like in a marathon is a, it, it's yeah. just a little tough. But all the music stuff in Village of the yeah. Giants is great. And yeah. I, and it's so hilarious to me. You have Bo Bridges as the leader of this gang <laughs> yeah. that terrorizes right. the city. You know, right. <laughs> well, even but right from the very beginning, as a kid, when they're all dancing in the mud, I'm like, all right, I'm in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I feel my funny brother, inside. <laughs> my my brother, who wrote uh, biographies, he's uh, for um, University of Mississippi Press for uh, Dan Durie and Jose Ferrer. Mm. So. He went and picked the snow creature, and it's a funny opening because he thought it was the abominable yeah, snowman. I, yeah, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, he watched it, and he, he couldn't find anything that he liked. About <laughs> it. Right. But really, I said, Mike, we got to find out. We're not, we're not here to bash the movies. I mean, I wonder what right, it right. is. And, and so basically, it's, it's about its place in this little mini subgenre of abominable right. snowman and Bigfoot movies. Uh, but it was funny to watch. Like, only a couple of people have to struggle finding positive things to write but <laughs> right <laughs> other than that everybody i think loves the movies they did down the line looking at the list now pretty much down the line king kong was the most challenging as it's my favorite movie my uh and how do i write something fresh about it so i mm -hmm. i i went from a specific point of view of authorship who who is it who is since this is the mommy and daddy of all giant beast movies who's the mommy and daddy of uh with, with the strange writing credit uh so it was really fun to do the research on that so I wasn't just writing a chapter about, it. and the stop motion animation was done by Willis O'Brien. Right, it's done, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, totally. that was all. That was all fascinating. And then the Son of Kong stuff I thought was really interesting. Yeah, strange, really interesting to immerse yourself in this this ramped up schedule they all had, and and Willis O'Brien's wife killing their kids. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I didn't know that. I did yes, not I, know that. Yeah. Wow, yeah, I, that's I knew nuts. That. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's tragic. It's so sad. Tragic. I mean, it's like yeah. so but <clears throat> strange stuff but uh do you yeah. still have your 16 millimeter print of king kong i do yeah i showed it i, showed I got it one too yeah nice <laughs> front of my house at halloween for the trick-or-treaters so uh does, does your uh, print does your print have some of the cutout scenes yeah it, it has it, yeah. It has oh the, nice the volume drops down a little and it's grainier um so they're yeah. i'm sure better, but yeah it's all in there all the nice. uh all the, uh, the natives getting squashed and yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ray, yeah. right? Yes. The, the, the nice. race, as it were. Yes. Right, right, yeah. It's all in there. Nice. Awesome. Stuff. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for having Thanks me. Thanks again, thank you. Stephen. Thank, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. And maybe we'll yeah. see you at the next uh, Monster Palooza or something. We have a table, yeah. so definitely come on by. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right, gentlemen, a pleasure. Wonderful. Thanks, Stephen. Cheers. Thanks, Stephen. Bye bye. bye. So I I've got a setup back there, James. I like your setup. Hasn't really changed yet, has it? It's nice. Thank you. Have you added no, something? No, I got. I did add the, uh, the the dog creature and the thing. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's the dog creature. Did you get the NECA dog creature yet? I did. Yes. I got to figure out. I got. I think I have to change. I have to mess with my displays because I'm running out of room for certain themes. So, yeah, I got to figure that out. I think it's okay for you to move some stuff in the. I studio. love moving it. I like ch I change creature, things all the time. I love to do that. Well, it's an opportunity to dust for me. Well, there you go. And I'm cleaning out the garage too, so I'm going in things. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I, gotta, I gotta put this in. I gotta put Whoa. this one up. I gotta do that. Oh, I forgot to open these figures. Let's do it. Oh, now, I gotta the tear these a, open. <laughs> I was kind of frustrated with this dog creature. Um, oh, tell me, James. Oh, ooh, ooh. because the assembly the assembly is a bit of a bear, honestly. Um, I. Well, not wow, a dog. Okay. <laughs> ah, nice one, Larry. There, there's ball joints, and it's like you got to bring out the hair dryer, and it's like, oh, I'm really oh cool. yeah, that's yeah, that's really, rough, you know? yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. really, yeah. 
but I you know, I, once I get it, once it's in, then I, I don't yeah, plan once, on once changing in, it for another 25 years, meaning yeah. on my deathbed. But it took me so much time and I was just like, guys, you know, we're, we're adults. We have responsibilities. We've got, you know, limited <laughs> time that we can spend on this shit. I didn't realize this was going to take the same amount of time. I don't know. It's going to be my day. life's work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little, little frustrating, but yeah. What was that, James? For what? The neck dog. Like dog, dog creature from the thing. You mean displaying it? You mean putting, putting it, it all together. together? Oh, is it is it pretty complex? It's just a little frustrating because like it doesn't all fit exactly stuff. right, right? Oh, you have to, no, you have to no. use a hair dryer to get. You got to use a hair dryer in the heat and all this. Like, oh <laughs> yeah, that uh, yeah, that is annoying. That's annoying. <clears throat> but, yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad you told me ahead of time because now I. My expectations will be ready. <laughs> right. You know what I did did find recently for like for like fifteen bucks from China. This this thing from a never, never ending. Story? Oh my god! Yeah. What's it? What's it called? A tray? No, not a tray. You. That's, that's the play, kid. Play, that's the play, kid. Play. But it's it's like it's just that's a, cool looking a, though. They did such a good job on it. I'm not a big fan of the movie, but uh, yeah, just, I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> I, I appreciate some of the effects in the movie, but as a t- overall t- total overall, it doesn't quite yeah. work. But I like it. It, I it like sure felt of- it sure felt like a never ending story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I liked it, and so the I'm song is the song up. is really charming. As if it's flying up. Oh, yeah, that oh, song. Yeah. Don't don't give me your <laughs> nah. Uh-uh, sorry. It, it, it's a it, never it, ending story. Please, please turn off this music. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I love that music. Yeah. It is I'll catchy, probably, though. You have so to admit. What's wrong with you? Like wrong with with you. Again, but I like the, the, the fact. Have you never heard other like real music? What? I'm just uh, curious. Hello. Yes. You they know. Made a, they made a sequel too. Never ending story two. Yeah, they made two sequels. Did they? Because well, oh, it never ended. They so they had to make it. You know that's that's going to be the a movie reboot. is still going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it never ended. Where? It never ended. <laughs> oh man. Well, we should do an episode on never ending stories. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. I'm not this one I'm not going to fight. <laughs> Let's do the commentary. <laughs>